Hello there. Welcome to the TechPoint Africa podcast. My name is Tim Godrim and I am your host for the day. On the podcast today, I have with me Bolu Abiodun and a guest, Rosemont Phil Otihiwa. And she's going to be joining us to speak about a lot of topics. Our first conversation would be around the peers, an update on the peers shutdown um, we have some update on that. We are also going to be talking about South Africa granting licenses to crypto startups. Finally, we will be looking at Nigeria's plans for artificial intelligence um, under our uh, able minister, Boston Tijani. So stay tuned and don't go away. So welcome, Rosemond. Thank let's, you very much. Let's get to meet you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Rosemond. Um, I am a corporate commercial and startup attorney. I am very, very passionate um, about uh, businesses succeeding, mm -hmm. and which is why I have played in the corporate commercial and tech space for close to a decade. Um, I am passionate about corporate governance. Um, I feel like corporate governance is the foundation for any business's sustainability. And I feel that being a very um, interesting continent, we are best poised to have the new generation of business. And so I find myself playing lots of roles um, in between offering legal and regulatory compliance. Um, I offer corporate governance services and I also act as a legal consultant for different accelerator and tech um, incubator book camps as well. Um, I currently run a firm, a consultancy practice, and I mentor right now um, with Google for Startups Africa. Um, in its accelerator program. So, yeah, it's finally okay. in between. That's a lot of things that you're doing, <laughs> and we are going to be discussing a lot of things as well. So, first would be uh, updates on the PR. So, a couple of weeks ago, and what looks like an April Fool joke was <laughs> posted, and the startup said it would be shutting down after struggling to find product market fits, or basically struggling to get in any traction um, with users and also had some troubles with compliance um, and then we also had some reports that they would be returning some of the funds to investors um, so the update we have on that is yes they would be returning some money um, nearly four hundred thousand dollars exact figures we are not giving but nearly four hundred thousand dollars and um, we are also aware that some investors are calling for an audit into the startup's finances so we are going to be looking at that and a couple of other um, questions so first is Yes, the company has shut down and um, founders want to return some money. But this is probably the first time that we are that we are getting sort of a look into the back into what happens after a startup says they are shutting down. Um, what is the right way for a startup to close shop? Okay, all right. So I'm going to speak to this answer because. One of the biggest problems that I see permeates um, our business landscape is really a lack of knowledge. Um, I always say that for every business, understand that you are playing in a regulatory landscape, which simply means that if you find yourself doing business in an economy, that economy has regulations mm -hmm. for almost everything, including shutdowns. Right. Um, in Sena and better climes, um, we have, for example, in the UK, we have administrative and insolvency practice laws that actually govern how companies are formally shut down. Right. I understand I'm speaking to startups as a yeah. unique um, organization, but I will speak a bit generally so that viewers that are listening to this can understand that we actually do have a company regulation in Nigeria that governs the art of shutdowns. Mm -hmm. You don't wake up one morning and say you're shutting down. There are regulations that guard shutdown. And under um, corporate practice, it's called insolvency practice. Mm -hmm. So you have companies where they file for bankruptcy. Um, you have what is called a creditor's wind up. That is when the investors see that the company is not breaking even or reaching its targets and is into a lot of debt. They can go to court and file a petition and say, this company should be shut down for ABCD reasons. The company itself can say, oh, we want to wind down for ABCD reasons. And what happens after is that the investors who come in, yeah who are seen as preferred shareholders, get the, their capital or get whatever amounts in terms of by the time sales of assets are done and in terms of how um, the company begins to you know, offset its debts and its liabilities, they get their payments first, right? So let's come a little into the startup world and how it actually functions. There are negative liquidation events and there are positive liquidation events. And it is important that as business founders and as builders, right, you need to have an understanding about the corporate structure of your company. By structure, I simply mean 
what does an exit look like? In the event that there is not a successful exit or there is an exit that turns out to not be very good, what should happen? Because all this boils under what is called corporate governance. Because corporate governance establishes what happens in the event of possibly an insolvency situation where there's inability for the company to remain operational or effective, where there's an inability to be able to provide business objectives and is unable to meet set targets. There are rules that are already established that define this. And the responsibility to do this is actually the boards of these organizations. Mm -hmm. Because there has to be an internal process. So yeah. I would say that I sense, based on what I have read, I wouldn't know more details, but based on some of the internal information I've also gotten, is that I feel like there was no firm grasp on what the internal process for exits should look like, which is why we are having issues that are contending against investors rightfully demanding for an audit of a company's bank accounts. Mm. Because one of the things that happen in a post-liquidation um, event is that there is an audit. In fact, audits are not meant to even be done at the end. They should be consistent in terms of maybe once a quarter, right? So I have questions, which is, is it that the company was not aware of inflows and outflows within their operational life cycle? And why are we having issues as regards founders not responding to emails by investors who are seeking to get accountability from the monies that they put into the company? Mm -hmm. So it definitely shows that there's a lot of mis. Uh, there, there's a lot of operational inefficiency that I can see and a complete disregard or no no business of corporate governance principles, right? So what the proper way, and I'll finalize with this, a company should be sure that is you bring all your creditors to the table. Your creditors include your investors. They include your shareholders. And let the books of the company be spread apart and let there be a forensic analysis as regards inflows and outflows, identifying assets, identifying liabilities and say, you know what, over the course of this amount of period, this is how much we are going to be giving back and basically come to some sort of uh, voluntary arrangement. Yeah. Because voluntary arrangement is also a way companies are also properly and legally shut down, mm. right? So there's a lot of responsibility and I see a lot of knowledge gap. Mm. Maybe I sincerely think maybe because the founders are really not conversant with what these things look like mm. and are not able to act in accordance. If that being the case, the investors obviously have a responsibility and right to ensure and insist and enforce that proper things are done. So they are well within their right to ask for whatever um, reports or rec records that they actually need to be able to justify that their funds were properly spent. And if not, the law should take its due course. Great. We have established that there's a process for shutting down. Because, and, and this is why I think it's important, we've seen quite a number of startups shut down. But we haven't, this is the first time we'll be getting a look into any, maybe on several details um, coming up after that decision has been, has been taken. And this is, I mean, for a lot of founders, like you mentioned, they are probably unaware that there's a right way to do this. And maybe some investors have let um, founders just shut down or startups shut down without enforcing these things. So I think it's, it's really important to point it out that you do not just wake up one morning and you shut down the business. There's a process that you must follow. Yeah. Uh, but I guess my next question would be, is there, are there like repercussions mm. in cases where founders do not take the right steps to either shut down the business or to give some accountability, or to give some updates during the life cycle of the business? Are there some steps that investors can take to ensure that they get what they should get? Okay. Um, so this is even full flowing from my question, so I will not be, uh, I won't spend too long here. So let's look at a very popular example. Uh, we've seen that Sam Bank Friedman has been arrested <laughs> and has been imprisoned and jailed, right? Yeah. <laughs> the, of yeah. the FTX crypto exchange. Mm -hmm. Those are some of, that is why I said sinner and better climbs. Mm -hmm. Because when you have a regulatory environment that is well equipped to handle situations like this, mm -hmm. Even if they'll say every day for the thief, one day for the world, mm. for the owner, right? Yeah. So I feel that we are getting to a point, these shutdowns have become almost a trend now. We're getting to a point where I sense that the government is going to do some serious clampdown as regards focusing on startups that do not actually go through the right procedure in terms of shutdowns. I see even if creditors do not come before the courts because litigation is a, is, is a role, is a tool, is a roadmap to mm. go and say you want to file for bankruptcy or depending on the, the, 
the company's um, jurisdiction, right? I'm assuming that Thipa in this case possibly may have a Nigerian registered entity and possibly a foreign registered entity. Yeah. It will be the responsibility of the investors to look at the laws that govern that jurisdiction and possibly take um, a litigation based approach. Mm -hmm. If they can settle out of court, great. Um, one of the things they can also do is to file for, um, of course, of course, the company will file for bankruptcy, right? Yeah. But there has to be some sort of creditors um, arrangement which has to be enforced. Yeah. And people have to be brought to book, whether by any pe by penalties or by imprisonment or whatever, mm -hmm. right? So I would say that, you know, if we there, there, be, there is a true um, evidence of mismanagement or fraud, then it's something that the investors do have a right to go to court and to say, you know what, we need to see evidence and the law that basically has to take its full course. You can't just say we are not doing business again and everybody goes to bed. It doesn't work that way. It's a, right? it's a relationship. It's you not, just break up with it's yeah. it text. Yes, so, it's so you said uh, it's almost becoming a trend, right? Mm. So which means that I feel that um, on the side of the investors, right, they, do they have responsibilities towards because... If you say it's becoming, you know, we've seen a lot of shutdowns, right? So are investors, is, are there responsibilities or things that they should take into account mm. before actually investing in these companies? Are there things oh, yeah. that um, they should even do yeah. after investments, um, things that they should follow up on, things that could have prevented, yeah. you know, um, 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 all these shutdowns due to whatever reasons? That they might have happened. I love that question. And it's it's because I've found myself in that context, yeah. sitting on the aspect or the angle of an investor. Before you decide to make an investment decision, we all know how the private equity space works. Yeah. You possibly have 5,000 applications. You narrow it down to 1,000. Mm -hmm. Narrow it down to 200. Narrow it down to 100. And you pick maybe your top three or top one, right? That means that for you to go through that funnel, there's a certain level of due diligence that has to be conducted. You are paying attention to their records, the financial records, whatever that may be. You are paying attention to the experience of the founders and the founding team. You are going beyond what they say on paper as regards what their milestones have been. And you fact check, mm -hmm. not just against what they present to you, but they are possibly if they have regulators, if they say, oh, we are governed by this. Okay, is this organization registered under this? If you say you have 10,000 customers, can we have a list of all these customers? Can we place calls to them? I'm not trying yeah. to say call 10,000, but it's, it's <laughs> due diligence. You yeah, can't, yeah. It's, it's hard work. Yeah. You mm -hmm. can't run away from it, mm -hmm. right? You know, and I feel that sometimes we gloss over these things as investors because once we see a, let me use, for example, a Y Combinator coming on your cap table and saying, oh, yes, these people are bought. Say, oh, yes, they've done all the work. We don't have to do anything <laughs> as well. You know mm. when you say somebody's leading a round yeah. Yeah. and they see a huge name that is leading that round, they're like, oh, let's go to bed. Let the smaller guys that are playing at the table just piggyback on what the lead um, investor has done. And mm. I think that should not be, right? We have an example of, I was talking about JP Morgan uh, arresting Frank, um, mm. the startup for falsifying over 3 million customers names that never existed. A whole JP Morgan <laughs> fell into that trap. Who are you not yeah. to do so, right? That's one. Now, he said something about what are some of the things you need to do in terms of checkmating against your investment decision. When you get a presentation and you are trying to have conversation as to amounts to put in, there are some things you ask for beyond mm. just your financial model and your financial analysis and your valuation report. You need to ask for what the fund use plan is. Mm. That fund use plan acts as a benchmark towards assessing what the company is doing vis-a-vis -vis what it does. Okay. So that fund use plan is not just in Q1, acquire 40,000 customers. It has to be detailed. Do you understand? How do you intend to get to point A to point B? And it can be a very gruesome process, but it allows the founders to think that, okay, if I am pegging a thousand customers against receipts of maybe $50,000, what's my marketing spend? I need to see those details so that I know what to track. Mm -hmm. So it's called a fund use plan for a reason. I get the monies in and I'm able to say, you know what, you are promising me ABC by the end of the day. Break it down into a chronological uh, roadmap. So that if this quarter happens and I do not see this milestone, I know who is at fault here. It is mm. not me, it's you or vice versa, right? So there's a fund use plan, there's a fund use analysis, and then there are basically KPIs that you measure and track your funding against. Mm. And you don't release additional funding until those milestones are met. That is how you monitor as an investor. That's how you play a role as an investor. That's how you, I wouldn't use the word micromanage, but that's how you become responsible for your monies that you've put into these companies. There are so many examples that I could give, but this is one of them. A quick one. 
if you're listening to us on Spotify or Apple Podcast, please leave us a review. Okay, so zooming out of this, right? Um, uh, we are having a discussion a couple of weeks in the office and mentioned that was in the office or in the house, I can't remember. Mm-hmm. But one of the things we are discussing was the effectiveness of the National Industrial Court, which sort of focuses on just employ, uh, employment, employ, matters, yeah, employment matters. employment matters. And I, I don't know if I had, if that was when I had that thought. But yeah, I, I'm I'm now thinking, right, we are trying to do, we are trying to treat startups as special in Nigeria. Whether they are or not is a, is a matter for another day, but we are trying to do that for them. Oh, please. Um, should we also have like a specific justice mechanism that focuses on them? And the reason I ask is um, one of the reasons why I think an investor may probably not want to seek redress in Nigeria is our justice systems can be really True. slow. I mean, I do not want to be tied up in court for the next few years just because I, I want to know how you spent $100,000 or 200000 whatever it may, it may be, right? So should do you think we should be looking at specific justice mechanisms that just focus on startups? I mean, there are probably like 5,000, 6,000 startups in Nigeria. So um, if we had just a section of the judiciary focused on them, perhaps that could speed up... Um, the dispensation of justice. Yeah. I love that. And I feel like where we are going right now, it's something we can no longer avoid. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll give you an example of an innovation that happened in the justice sector because I did practice in litigation for a couple of years. And what happened is that there began to be so much backlog on company cases that happened because we realized that co- ma- cases were not being called fast. There was a lot of delays. Mm-hmm. So what the... Um, judiciary did at the time was to create what they call specialized courts, which they mm-hmm. called small claims courts. Yeah. So for monies that were between a million and five million, there was a special court that we treated and there was a regulation that said you have to finish your case end to end in 60 days. Mm-hmm. So from the hearing to the trial to the submission of your of your final final address and mm-hmm. all that, right? And I'm speaking from a litigation aspect. But for mm-hmm. startups, yes, I believe strongly mm-hmm. if we need to establish a unique system to handle the very nature of this ecosystem, it's something that we have to consider, right? Although right now, they would still fall under the basic companies uh, because they're registered in Nigeria. If you're a registered <laughs> company, you can sue and be sued. Yeah. So you're under the general perspective. But maybe because of our unique situation, getting funds from investors in USD and the fact that we do not sort of have a developed Delaware system as exists in other foreign jurisdictions, mm. we may have to have something that is unique to our ecosystem. But we still fall under the challenge of bureaucracy and, of course, speed mm. and all that. So I would say it's a good uh, proposition, but I am more interested in the effectiveness than awesome. just the establishment of it. Yeah, very important because we are very good at setting up committees in Nigeria yes. Yes. <laughs> without, <laughs> without actually having those committees. Exactly. Do anything. Well, um, one more question on that, on this story would be, um, there, were, there were reports that um, some investors or some shareholders did not get updates on what was going on in the company. And this is... I mean, it's usually a conversation uh, on Twitter once in a while, and then some founders talk about it, some VCs joke about it. But I, how often should mm. I, as a founder, give updates to my investors? And now this is, of course, stage specific. So I guess we can start with pre-seed or early early stage. So how frequently should I give updates, and what should be contained in those updates? Lovely, 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 lovely question. Um, so I would say that. We, so going back to this knowledge gap, mm. we have, and I think this is something that I need to mention, everyone who is listening to this podcast right, right now needs to understand that Nigeria as itself has a regulation that governs things like this. We have the Financial Reporting Council of Nigeria that released what is called the, code of, the, the Nigerian Code of Corporate Governance 2018. That code has about 12 principles that talk about issues as regards composition of your board, that has to do with transparency, mm. remuneration, reporting, um, and internal controls, risk management, and mm. gives you very specific recommendations that you can implement today that can solve these issues that you've asked, right? But mm. from experience, um, for pre-seed early stage, we're not saying that you have to bombard your investors every week. But at least in a quarter, send something, mm. right? We need to. That's why I talked about the fund use plan. 
Mm. Because before you sign any contract, because what usually happens in a funding phase is that there will be a term sheet. There will be an exchange of a term sheet. The term sheet is going to contain what the company's valuation is, what they intend to give as employee stock options, what they are trying to get, what they are trying to use the monies for. Basically, if they are going to be, what's their exit plan going to look like, right? And mm. those are some of the things that you look at. Now, you have to track. I always um, advise a situation from investors that, by the time you put in monies, don't put in everything at once. Give in tranches. And let mm. those tranches be pegged against specific KPIs. Okay. Right? And one of the things I read in that report was that I think there was supposed to be did an inflow of two point something million dollars. Two point one million. Two point one. Yes. And I think they only had they said they were only going to give back three hundred and something. Mm. And somebody, one of the investors, uh, one of somebody was saying about seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars did not come in. Yeah. And I'm saying wh where where is all this? Where are this contradiction information come mm. from? That means mm. that there is no clear reporting system. Mm. One of the principles of corporate governance is that there has to be clear reporting structure, especially when it comes to financial reporting. There is supposed to be a bank account somewhere now. It's not in the air. Mm -hmm. There's a track record, right? There are inflows, there are outflows. If it didn't come in, it didn't come in. If it went out, it went out. So if investors are asking that, oh, you said you 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 are ma you made this announcement and this money is not coming, why? What's the reason? There has to be a forensic um, ex um, investigation into those accounts, and I think it's something that the investors should insist happen, right? So early stages, the the duration as regards the um, submission of reports and records can be mutually decided, but mm. our advice, a quarter should not pass with, without at least two, two um, updates. submissions, two updates. Okay. All right. I mean, we've spent quite some time on this, but I think one key takeaway here would be the, the fact that there's like a knowledge gap, but either maybe from the investors or from the founders, but, I'm, but it's looking more like on the founder side. Um, so whatever you need to do as a founder, like just go get the information. If you need to hire a professional to do that, um, if you need to maybe get someone, a consultant to just walk you through what you need to do, like um, I think it's very important to fill that gap because um, stories like this, of course, you always say, oh, the founders will come back better, but it also sends a signal. If we continue to see that startups do not have proper governance structures okay. in a country that is not exactly very famous for having wonderful legal systems, then it kind of dampens investor confidence. Exactly. And it's really important that we kind of um, fix this gap. I mean, whether you want to pay yourself 15K or not, but if you mm. are, please, if you're a lady and you can pay yourself 15K, you know where to find me. So, wow. <laughs> <laughs> moving on to our next story. Let's plug. <laughs> I mean, yes. So, moving on to the next story, which is South Africa's crypto asset provider licenses. Mm. So, will you give us a lowdown on that? All right, yes. So, it's just like uh, what you said. Um, South Africa has granted um, licenses to um, crypto um, service providers mm. or crypto companies, whatever you want to call them. Uh, Nigeria calls them um, virtual asset um, service providers. Yeah. So, in South Africa, these companies have been, uh, 75 of them have been granted um, crypto licenses, mm. right, which is interesting because... Um, if you look at um, the crypto regulatory landscape, there are a lot of things. Um, there, has, there has always been issues with governments and crypto companies, government and cryptocurrencies itself. So um, I think what makes this story interesting is because of that history that we know that governments have had with uh, anything called crypto. So it's kind of like a step in the right direction. Um, it's kind of like as if there seems like there's some um, um, regulatory oversight, proper regulatory oversight coming mm. to um, crypto finally, yeah. right? And it's not just South Africa. Kenya is also making some progress. Um, in Nigeria, um, it seems like we're making progress, but <laughs> I don't know what your next question is, but I, I don't want to preempt. <laughs> okay, so I don't know. What kind of value can this unlock for South Africa? Okay, so um, like I said, the first thing is now there will be proper regulatory oversight, right? Because mm. if so, if you give someone license, it's expected that oh, there are things they are supposed to do, there are um, ways they are supposed to operate, mm. there are reports they are supposed to give, right? They cannot do like Patricia and do whatever they ah. want, shut down. Okay. Or, so <laughs> we have proper like you are holding, you have licenses, mm. right? 
there are things you are doing. You are holding people's money. Oh, you are helping them trade. You are helping them do this. So now, I think there will be more trust within the crypto ecosystem. Users can trust better. Um, also, I think there's revenue generation for the government, right? Because now that you have oversight over them, you can tax them properly. You know how much they are making. You know how they are operating. Then you can make some money from them, right? Mm. So I think um, those are some of the values that South Africa can can capture from this, and it also helps when new in, um, crypto innovations come, come up. Yeah. So you now know because you already have like. A, a regulatory yeah. framework yeah, no. so now you can now if new things come up whether it's nft whether it's this whether it's that you now know okay for this so this is how you should do it if you are going to offer these services this is how you should go about it so i think those are some values that they can unlock from it all right so rosemond earlier we were talking about recognition versus yeah. um acceptance yeah. um let's talk about that does the fact that there's now a regulatory oversight yeah. <laughs> um, for crypto startups in South Africa, does it automatically translate to acceptance by the government? Honestly, <laughs> the <laughs> very big answer is a no. It does not. <laughs> okay. um, what has happened is there's been a meet in the middle situation here. Mm. The government definitely, as many governments have, have realized that this is something that has come to stay, really. Mm -hmm. The best you can do is to ensure that you don't just keep cancelling and cancelling. You know the Nigerian situation yeah. where we just <laughs> got a regu what they noticed that banks should clamp down. You know, thankfully that has been overrun now by but the new what's happening now is even but worse. the challenge <laughs> right, that I yeah. see is that yes you have these regulations which is good okay. but the truth is that it doesn't translate to because even the financial services uh, control authority in South Africa yeah. did make a public announcement to the fact that as much as there it is a regulation it does not officially recognize cryptocurrency as a legal tender exactly Mm. And even the uh, South African uh, Reserve Bank or so, they, are, they actually yeah. did also make a statement that it doesn't recognize an official legal tender. Mm. So there have been arguments that the regulation itself justifies it to be used as tender. They are the there's the announcement, but as long as the government has said, we don't see this thing as money, you can't come and pay your NEPA dues. I don't know if they call it's, it NEPA there. Yeah. with it's crypto. <laughs> <laughs> or you cannot pay your taxes in mm. crypto and things like that. You yeah. know, it is what it is. Mm. But the good thing I will just finalize here is that at least they've recognized the fact that there are uh, virtual uh, asset service providers, the ones mm. that act as exchange platforms, the ones that can advise, that can offer advisory. And of course, there's the, I think they're about Two categories of licenses, uh, yeah. license one and two. Yeah, one, one is just two. advisory and um, uh, management. The yeah. other one is advisory management and investor, um, what's the word, investor acceleration. Basically, you can invest in all those things. So I think it's good. It's a good step mm -hmm. in the right direction. Whether it's going to be recognized as, as legal tender, tender is something that I cannot say at this, at this moment. Yeah. Okay, so that was a very short one, but I mean... There isn't so much to say for crypto. There's one more thing to to say actually. So the, the thing is, South Africa is making progress when it comes to you know actually bringing these people together. And say okay, take your license, take your license, take your license, right? Mm -hmm. Um, like we said, better regulatory oversight, right? Doesn't mean acceptance, but it means okay, we see you, right? We we see you. Let's work together, right? Um, but then I think. Uh, one 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 very key thing about this is, um, you know, South Africa is one of the um, is one of the major countries when it comes to like crypto acceptance and but then I think Nigeria is like in Africa I think Nigeria is like one of the leading countries when it comes to crypto acceptance and adoption, and it's funny that um, while South Africa is making progress in this space, right, um, Nigeria doesn't seem to. In 2022, we had our own guidelines that, okay, these are the guidelines to get your own licenses, mm -hmm. right? But if today, we do, I don't know any confirmed, any company that has been confirmed, any crypto company that has been confirmed to um, have a license, license in yeah. Nigeria. And one of the reasons, you know, I've seen a lot of people mention is the amount it takes, you know, to get a license. In, regist mm -hmm. in Nigeria, the, regist the registration fee alone is <laughs> $93,000. Okay, right, paid up capital of about one billion naira, but then um, I'm not sure what the f um, figures are exactly in South Africa. But um, one of the articles I saw showed that it ranges from about three hundred dollars to at most three thousand dollars, right? Okay. To 
or to pay for those registrations. So I think maybe our own regulators should probably take a cue <laughs> from <laughs> Saturday because you need oversight on these people. You need to be able to control them, right? Even if you will not accept them because these people are holding citizens' money. People are investing a lot in these things. So um, maybe they should take some cue, maybe bring their money down a little because, again, you chase a lot of <laughs> players out. You chase them maybe away. Maybe that's <laughs> I mean, Maybe uh, to be fair, that's true. actually what I think. I mean, okay. if I don't want you to come to my house, all I need to do is give you a vague address and you keep on roaming around the street. So I believe... Or raise the high fence mm. or yeah. I don't knock when you enter. Exactly. Or I don't enter, oh, sorry. So I just believe that putting that is... There's a reason for that. Mm. It's it's to ensure that the barrier to entry is very high because I don't but know how many... people will enter anyway. Yes, people will enter and, anyway. From a legal way, perspective, right, the barrier to entry is really high, I can tell you, because mm. w- when I was looking through the uh, proposed amendment, speaking to Nigeria now, yeah. right, um, even though you are going to have capital market operators, if you are going to have a VSP service of some sort, right, you have to re-register it as a subsidiary. You can't, you can't collapse your traditional financial services with your crypto services at the same time. That's one of the changes that were made. Okay. The second thing also was the increase, like you yeah. mentioned. Like it was, it, there was a serious, serious increase, one. right? And 400%. I think four hundred percent increase. And I think it's something that is being done intentionally. I would, I wouldn't say with bad mind, but it is that anybody that's going to play in this space is going to be serious enough to put their money where their mouth is. Yeah. And it's actually paid capital, so the money must be in the bank <laughs> or it must be in assets. Do you understand? It cannot. It's not in the air. Just put mm. it on the document. So it's a lot, but yeah, that's where we are. Yeah, okay. It is what it is. It is what it is. Well, yeah. Um, so that's it for South Africa crypto license Nigeria. Um, I don't know who wants to take a cue from who, but we are going to find out in a couple of weeks or months. So moving on to our last story. We are back to Nigeria now. I mean, we've been in Nigeria, but yeah. Back to Nigeria and your minister or ministry our of minister. communications, digital innovation has launched a large language model so first of all large language learning model large language learning model yes um we've established on the podcast that ai electricity we can all we can all work towards making sure that all of them are successful yeah so we're not going to have that conversation but what we are going to have is looking at first why was this announced? So earlier we were talking about it and okay, so <laughs> let it not be like we're we chanting the government, right? Okay. But it looks like this is still in developmental phases. Nothing much has been done. It's basically um, a proposal. You've told me you want to get married to me and that's just it. You haven't come to see my parents. You haven't done any serious thing, right? Not this is <laughs> you've not set a date to see my parents. It's just... Um, as someone said, it's it's word of knowledge. You've told me that this is what you want to do, right? So Nigeria has launched it. Um, but I guess first question would be, um, what does this mean for Nigeria? Um, why should we? Wh- I mean, why is this worth celebrating by those who are celebrating it? First of all, mm. so um, Rosemont, do you want to take yeah, a shot? I will. I will. Um, very interesting. So first of all, as much as I would like to tell you with you in relation <laughs> to. <laughs> no, we're chanting. Okay. Um, the truth is, artificial intelligence is something that um, no continent can escape. Mm. And what we're trying to do, or what I see the minister trying to do, is to put Nigeria on the map when it comes to our own thing. Yeah. Um, the essence of the LLM in quotes is because of the need for more indigenous representation mm-hmm. of language because language is a tool is a tool for it's a tool f- to communicate is where you can encapsulate history it's how you can teach and all that right mm-hmm. um looking through some of the things that was shared the vision and everything behind it it's the fact that the objective in itself is to allow for more representation of nigeria's indigenous tribes languages and cultures in mm-hmm. building artificial intelligence based products yeah. right so even though they call it a launch, you know, you say usually the word launch happens when something is finished. Exactly. But what we have here is a launch for something that is just starting. 
mm-hmm. or that is in the pipeline or is ongoing, right? Because what we can see is that the LLM model is actually supposed to be a couple of people, as many people as possible, mm-hmm. coming there, putting their words, their mm-hmm. language in different translations into different languages, which I believe will be mined and used as a large data um, repository using machine learning, deep learning and the likes to now create whatever services that needs to be done. Typically, let me give a, and I'm not a, I'm not a core core tech code <laughs> developer, sis, but no, I can say yeah. the reason why Google Map can have our tone mm. in talking to us, in direct, giving us directions is because somebody took that data, used our tone of words, and used that to be able to give us the same instructions that and a Caucasian is the same behind Google Map. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So Nigeria is just trying to do its own thing, which I would say is a good step in the right direction, but we need to not place the car before the horse. Well, yeah. we have legislations to think about, we have AI policies to think about, we have data protection and a couple of things that go around using AI in an ethical and sustainable manner to think about. But for me, it's a, it's, it's a good one. And I just feel that we can be a bit more strategic um, about it. That's what I, I mean, that's a, that's a diplomatic way to say that you should not be launching something that you've not finished. <laughs> but we are going to come back to data privacy because yeah. it's it, we're talking about data privacy and this whole um, AI LLM earlier. Um, I guess, Bulu, mm. why is the government spared in the building of a large language learning model for mm. a country and not a and not a startup or maybe any technology company. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Um, one of the reasons why um, you know they recently they just concluded the AI workshop right in Abuja, and one of the reasons why our Boston Sijani has been very hard on AI is because there's a gap. There's a huge gap when it comes to AI, mm-hmm. right, in Nigeria and Africa generally, right? which means one. We don't even have enough AI startups to begin with. Mm-hmm. Two, we don't even have enough AI professionals, right? People who are trained to actually build these products, right? So um, it is expected that the government will play a part in creating this LLM, right? But then there's also, they are actually private. They've partnered with some um, private companies to do this, Um um, there's a company called Awari. 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 Yeah. yeah. That they've partnered yeah. with to you know for data collection mm-hmm. basically. So there's a platform where you go, you record your voice, mm-hmm. uh, you record your local language, translate to English, write text, do all those things, right? So um I get why um we are doing this in partnership with the because we don't have those startups that are there yet that can just do this on their own. If it's, for example, fin- something so, so fintech related. L- let now. me let me pause you there or interrupt you. Um, yes, we do not have a lot of startups doing this, but it's not like your government itself has has this twenty year old AI research um, center that they've been running. We do not have something like that. So I am still not sold on why the government is involved. So here's the thing, right? Okay. We are we hear that some money has been like they've gotten some funding for this, about three point five million dollars if I'm not mistaken. Yes. yes in funding for this. Um you could have directed that funding to another to a startup or to a company where you have some oversight. Okay. You could be one of the investors. Okay. You could sit on the board and have them like give you periodic updates on what's happening. Mm. And the reason I say this is governments are not exactly innovators. In fact, they're not even I mean Yeah right. I'm being right I'm being nice by saying to... that they are not exactly they are not innovators, right? And I see a situation where two years from now we are still going to be struggling with in short, we will not have moved the needle mm. Mm. because it's not there's no profit incentive really for the government. And once there's no profit incentive, the only, th- the only thing that governments are very good at is taxation, to be honest, right? And without that profit incentive, why should they bother? How do they even convince users, for example, to submit their data, which is the, the next thing we'll talk about. Like, how do you convince a user mm. to submit your data? How do you ensure that you're getting the best hands, which is very important here, how do you ensure that you're getting the best hands for this? Because like you mentioned, there's a death of 
AI professionals in Nigeria. And now a government that doesn't exactly have an AI footprint is leading this uh, kini. And yes, of course, we have uh, we have some partners, UNESCO, Meta, Google, Microsoft. But for some reason, there's just a whole lot of one foreign involvement for a country that wants to build their indigenous AI um, um, language model. You have a lot of foreign investment. And I don't know, there are, so, there are so many questions that the government probably needs to answer or reconsider. But let's talk about data privacy. Earlier, we were trying right. to log into the system and <laughs> Rosemond has refused to impute our details. I have refused, please. So, there's, there are a lot of lapses. So, first of all, um, when you look at the, when you try to log in, just, uh, or when you try to sign up, just click on terms and uh, the terms and uh, conditions, conditions or service policy. Yeah. Click on it and you see some very, very interesting things. It just looks like the terms was probably generated by ChatGPT or copied from an existing company. I don't know. I probably would run it on the internet Ooh. and see if I get a match. But it looks like it was copied from one place and just pasted. I don't know what, how that makes me feel because first of all, it makes me feel like an unserious person because if you just duplicate Spotify's um, terms and conditions and you put it, so some of the things you see, let me open that thing. Oh again. my God. <laughs> so don't worry, they won't, they, won't, they won't show you it on the you screen, but I'll just show you some of the things you would see. So terms of use, um, look at under privacy. Okay, now let's start with intellectual property. All content, including but not limited to text, images, all of that is a property of Company name hmm. or its licenses. When I look at the website, there's something called Lang Easy here, powered by Awari. So, why is Lang Easy or Awari not here? Privacy. Company name respects the privacy of its users. Who in the world is if company, company name? name? Are... When you come to juris, uh, governing law, these terms of use shall be governed by and construed in accordance with the laws of jurisdiction without regard to its conflict of law provisions. Who is jurisdiction? That's... Contact information. I you get the point. Now yeah. the last time I know we had a conversation like this yeah. was the the coup. Is it coup that they call themselves? That um oh. upstart that said it wanted to take on oh. Twitter. Yes. It was a similar situation. Yeah. They they had shitty terms of use on their website. But that aside, um why what was it, what are your thoughts on um the lack of appropriate um, or the lack of attention being paid to data privacy because this is just what it shows me that you're not very serious about uh, data privacy. No, I feel bad yeah. for him putting all my data. Putting oh, you put your data. Well, I mean, I, to register. <laughs> I know no, that's yeah. not serious data. Oh, okay. now. You register on things every day. Um, so this is to be honest, it's it's really not. But I I I have no words <laughs> right because. If you are doing something, and honestly, I really want to be on—I really want to be the good person here, and I'm—and <laughs> I'm being this because. Don't worry, you're free to be the bad person. Really. No, no, honestly, because I—it's—it's—it it takes a lot to even get here, mm -hmm. right? It takes a lot, especially for a regulator to get here. Now, what we can do, and I think what we are really, really doing as a private sector, is to put a lot of pressure. Mm -hmm. um, for data uh, privacy, this is a very important part because people are going to be putting. Their voices on this yeah. platform, it's possibly going to be reposited somewhere mm. in some cloud, somewhere. Um, I need to know where my data is being stored. Yeah. I need to have the ability to have access to recollection mm. or deletion. If there's going to be some sort of measures as regards data uh, anonymization or pseudonymization, whatever it is, right? I need to be confident enough that my voice is not going to be used one day. Right to call my uncle <laughs> to say that I need money for one million dollars in surgery, mm -hmm. and I know that my voice is not going to be you because it's voice, yeah. right? You know, and because AI is evolving so rapidly, I sense that this is the time where regulators have to run to catch up, yeah. right? And I can say for a fact that some ethical considerations also will be in terms of the capacity to even use this do we have do we have age limits here do mm. we have restrictions as regards the terms of use do we have the um data portability 
What does it look like? We need to understand what the end-to-end -end use of this data looks like from the, from the government's perspective. And it's even sadder that we have the NITDA, which is actually a regulator on this Involved project, and this, we are yeah. seeing some of these lapses. So I believe that if they are listening to this, it's something that they have to keep looking at. Because this is the essence, this is the output or the fruit of the data workshop, the AI workshop, right? <laughs> yeah. I believe so. Yes, it is. And there was an inauguration of the National Center for Artificial Intelligence and Robotics, which just launched. Mm. So while I commend greatly that we, it is a good start, um, we need to do something well. Anything we're doing is worth doing well. Yeah. And if we are playing in such an interesting field like artificial intelligence, we have to bring our best mind. We cannot be... Uh, what is the word? We cannot be flippant about some very critical things so that we True. don't allow our good be even spoken of. Exactly. That's what I was Some, saying. Someone said, concerning th that audio and video stuff, uh, mm -hmm. someone said it's all fun and games, right? Do you stand in a court and they play, yeah. <laughs> play an audio of your voice? You know. I, said, I mean, so... Are you telling me you didn't say this? <laughs> I, so just yesterday, like, <laughs> there was this... Um, I saw this ad of a customer service um, AI products so that's right mm. now it's it it can do a lot of things um, customer service um sales i think and a few other things that's to show you how um, rapidly this thing oh. is evolving and Crazy. if you do not um which is why i get why the, yeah why yeah. he's yeah. bullish on all of this but you also need to have like guardrails proper guardrails and now considering that Nidida is involved in this and this turned out this way I'm just wondering how how is our data managed like for either startups for example that have to collect data businesses that have to collect data mm. right how is our data current like what's need that doing to ensure that these businesses are actually collecting storing and using the data within the confines of what they've stated that they'll be doing because um until trouble starts we probably would never find out so it's it's one more reason for us to question need to that handling of that ministry, really. But yeah, um, we've had a very interesting conversation oh, yeah. today. Um, as you are probably aware for older listeners, we have a new um, segment on the podcast, which is Insight of the Week. And for today or for this week, that would be funding, in, uh, funding for fintech startups in Nigeria. So um, since... We started collecting data and that goes back to about 10 years now. Um, it's only once in 2021 that Nigerian startups, Nigerian fintech startups raised more than a billion dollars. Um, of course, 2021 was like the boom year. I think startups did about four to five billion, depending on who you're asking. So that was like a good year for them. So that's the only time it dropped to 850 million the next year and it's been sliding down. My mm. prediction is it's, it's going to be way worse this year. Um, but do not take my word for it. So yeah, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. We've had a very lengthy, interesting discussion, and we would love to hear your feedback. If you're watching on YouTube, you could drop us a you could drop us a comment. Please do. Um, it helps with the algorithm, I believe, and um, makes more people to see this. You could also share on your social media um, channels. If you are joining us on, or if you're listening to this on audio platforms, Spotify. I had radio, YouTube, wherever it is, um, you could also share, drop a like. And if you would rather send us an email, uh, you could do that at podcast at techpoint.africa. P O D C A T at techpoint.africa. Once again, thank you so much, Rosemont, for joining us. Thank you and much, thank you, Bolu, you. for, you're, you're absolutely for being on the podcast. I mean, you're it's welcome. not like you had a choice, but yeah, thank you for <laughs> being on the podcast. <laughs> And um, it's what do you think of the tech point? Thank you so much. And much. I'll Bye -bye. see you next time week. for pictures. <laughs> Don't forget to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify.